Up today, we're going to be speaking with Todd Allen, Global Head of Marketing at Budweiser. Todd, so excited to have you on today's episode. Thanks so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Matt. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. We're going to start by quickly getting a little bit about you. You've had a long career in the packaged goods and, and beverage space, and we'd love to hear a little bit about your journey. Yes, I've been in uh, FMCG for well over 20 years now. Um, started in Canada, um, working for Unilever and in various sales and marketing roles for, for about 10 years. Uh, and then I joined Anheuser-Busch InBev uh, in 2012, uh, and I've been with the company for uh, 10 years. Uh, again, in Canada, w leading brands like Budweiser, Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, had the good fortune to do my first stint in our global headquarters, uh, leading Stella Artois globally for a couple years in 2015. Then went back to Canada to, to be the CMO for, for our Canadian operation. Uh, and for the last two years, I've been back here at global headquarters, uh, leading marketing for Budweiser. So an honor and privilege uh, to, to work for the world's most valuable alcohol brand here. Absolutely. And for younger people that are part of our audience that are thinking about getting into a career in brand marketing, what are some of the main takeaways or learnings that you can point to from your time at Unilever, which is such a well-established, renowned, you know, global house of brands? Like, what did you take away from that that really positioned you well to put you along the journey where, to where you are today? I think first and foremost is, you know, being curious, um, you know, in, in, to be an effective marketer in today's world, you, you need to be curious because the landscape is constantly evolving. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that'd be number, num, number one. Uh, number two, just having an unbelievable, you know, passion for creativity uh, to solve true uh, consumer and customer problems. I, I really believe as a marketer, that's our number one job to do is to really use creativity to solve problems for consumers and customers that ultimately drive uh, business growth for, for, for our business overall. Uh, and, and then just, you know, have, have an immense passion for, for consumer insights and understanding, you know, always trying to, to, to understand, you know, consumers as people, um, you know, what is the, the insight driving their behavior uh, that you can ultimately develop a creative solution against. Um, and, and just show up, you know, in their lives where you add, truly add value. Like, what, what would consumers miss if your, your brand didn't exist? And, and how do you bring relevance to them every day? Absolutely. And, you know, we, you and I have almost the same timeline of going to the professional world. And when I tell my kids that when I first started working, the Internet was just becoming a thing. Um, and it wasn't until maybe 10 years into my career, and it looks like yours, by the time you left Unilever, the iPhone was invented, right? And here we are in 2022. It's a completely different world. Given all that, how has the role of managing and building a brand changed over time and over the course of your career? What are some of the shifts you've had to make to be a more effective marketer? Well, one, I think the fragmentation of media uh, has mm -hmm. evolved so much uh, over the last 20 years. Really, you know, from from a model where you used to be able to reach your audience, you know, with, you know, select media channels, yeah. you know, the right content and the right media channels. Uh, but that media now is fragmented, um, you know, and, and it's moved from, you know, broadcast age to now no more social digital media where the metas of the world, the Googles of the world have aggregated the audiences through their platform and you need to, you know, reach their, the, that audience through their platforms in a, in a, you know, fit for format way, the right message at the right time with the right context. And now what we're seeing, you know, with the pandemic has really accelerated um, this uh, direct to consumer trend that was already ha happening. Right. Mm -hmm. And now with the pandemic, with more people uh, in home using the home as the hub, you know, the direct to consumer is going to be the next, you know, big uh, forefront of especially in your category. Right. Because that was a, that was a lagging category ordering in beer, wine, spirits, has, you know, obviously didn't take off as quickly as some other you know, categories in the food and beverage space. Yeah, definitely. Now, now you're going to have to build, you know, that community, that one-to-one -one relationship with, with everyone going forward um, and provide true utility for them um, to, to, to be able That's to reach right. them in a relevant and meaningful way. Yeah. And as, as part of that, you know, obviously with all the changes with Apple and your ability to target consumers in a D2C world, you know, how important is first-party data and what are some of the challenges um, given that you're an alcohol brand um, in, in collecting first party data. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly important, um, you know, and obviously we do it respecting all the, the guidelines yeah. and legal restrictions. Um, 
Uh, and then one thing we're also doing uh, with, with at AB InBev is building our own suite of world-class digital products. So if you think of uh, brands like Zay Delivery in Brazil um, and brands that we're building in Tada uh, in Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, specifically in Latin America, we're building that you know direct to consumer e-commerce business uh, on a one-to-one -one level with with our consumers. So so it's that that it's a, an unbelievable way for us to 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 reach our audience uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so it's building you know our own suite of digital products. But then mm -hmm. an example like Budweiser, for example, we have um, our biggest ever global campaign with uh, the World Cup coming up. Um, yeah, we're gonna get to that. To take. One element is limited edition packaging with QR codes that people can scan, you know, uh, buy, scan, and have the chance to win, um, you know, amazing uh, tickets to the FIFA World Cup and other instant prizes. And then, you, you know, using that relationship, then be able to communicate to them throughout the tournament, letting them know when different watch parties are happening, different promotional events, so on and so forth. So it's, it's very important. Yeah. And, and, you know, you kind of um, answer the question I was going to ask before I asked it, which is usually the sign of a great marketer. Um, but, you know, if I were if I had your job and I was day one, you know, here you are sitting, you know, really behind the controls of a iconic American brand, which is what Budweiser is. And I look at it um, like Nike or Cadillac or some of these other brands that have been around for so long. And, you know, obviously the rub when, when you're behind an iconic American brand is you have this sort of tension between respecting the legacy brand equity pillars on um, which a brand like Budweiser is built on, but also being able to progress and contemporize the brand for, you know, a new generation of beer drinkers. You know, how do you deal with that tension there in terms of, because I know some of the things you're doing around the World Cup is, is super progressive. You just gave an example of a tactic. But do you often, I don't want to say struggle, but contend with making sure that you don't lose the heritage and history of the brand and what made it so special at the same time? Yeah, well, it definitely. And we we we're, we want to lean into the values of what made Budweiser so special in the right. U.S. and now the most valuable alcohol brand around the world. And, and the values are really true everywhere that you go like it's around ambition it's around optimism and, and we want to connect with with our fans and our drinkers around the world that, that have those same values the people that have the ambition to go for it in life you know that you know despite the the naysayers and the obstacles that sit in your way to have that drive to really go for it uh, in life, the way that you know Budweiser, you know, his founder story is amazing. Of two immigrants from from Germany came to Missouri, you know, had a dream of creating and bringing the the lager beer to to the Americans, and and ultimately founded Anheuser Busch and Budweiser and grew it, as I said, to what it is today. So, so we stay true to the values of the brand. We un and we're completely uh, uncompromising on our quality. Uh, in terms of delivering that that crisp, clean taste uh, of refreshment to, to every, no matter where we brew uh, Budweiser, our quality standards are, are unheralded. Um, so, so you know that the, that's the balance. You know, stay true to the values of the brand, stay true to our our our, uh, our quality standards, uh, and then show up. You know, in a relevant way, uh, in the different countries where where uh, our audience, um, you know, interacts with our brand uh, in a meaningful way. Yeah, and sp and speaking of balance, you know, the, a lot of markers also have to face this balance between upper funnel and lower fu lower funnel, right? Brand building and performance uh, marketing. I, I saw a couple of weeks ago that you guys were named uh, the world's most effective marketer. Um, uh, you know, behind the global uh, FE index, which is. An amazing award. I spent 20 years in the advertising industry before getting the software. I know how important that is and what an accolade it is on behalf of your team. How do you become an effective brand in your advertising and marketing when you are spending money on above the line that's maybe slightly less, less measurable? How are you able to connect that into a measurement plan that allows you to be confident in your spend in, in this market? Yeah, well, we, we take a full funnel approach to everything now. So mm -hmm. it, it's not, a, not an or, uh, it's an and. You, you sure. Have to still, you need to still build the brand affinity and the top of mind awareness for that mental availability for consumers at the top of the funnel. But then you need to use data uh, and you need to use the community that you've built to, to drive conversion at the bottom of the funnel. So we, we're, we're putting as much effort into developing creative solutions at the bottom of the funnel than we were than we are at the top of the funnel as well. So for us, it's an it's it's an and it's not an or. Yeah. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know we you know uh, we, we use all the modern marketing mix models to to evaluate our, our effectiveness and measurement and 
it's been amazing for us as we, we set out on a journey uh, to become the world's most effective uh, creative marketer. The, and we achieved that in 2022. So it was really about, you know, we got recognized by Can Lion as marketer of the year this yeah. year. Wark has us as, as number one in creative and creative effectiveness. And as you mentioned, uh, the Global EFI Index uh, just recognized us as the, the most effective marketer in the world. So it's an amazing accomplishment, but we're not, we're not satisfied with that yet. We want to stay at the top of that mountain, but now evolve with digital integration and, and the bottom of the funnel uh, and, and continue to, to focus on building that brand love at the top of the funnel and, and driving conversion uh, all at the same time. And, yeah, and I would imagine a big part of also being effective is not just focusing on the consumer, but also the trade side, whether it's off-premise or on-premise, you know, with COVID hopefully winding down. We've heard that before, but assuming it does, obviously um, your on-premise business is probably, uh, you have great comps uh, from the last couple of years as people are filling bars and nightclubs, et cetera. Um, how important is the on-premise and trade marketing um, in terms of being effective and, and how do you split your time um, as somebody who's staying on top of the brand on a global basis? Yeah, it's, it's critically important, as you mentioned. Um, and, you know, we take an omni-channel approach as we develop our creative solutions for uh, whatever it may be, if it's a campaign like the Budweiser FIFA World Cup or if it's, uh, um, you know, an equity uh, problem we're trying to solve. We really take a full funnel uh, and omni-channel approach to it. So. Being able to activate at retail, whether it's the supermarkets, the you know the big the the, the big traditional retailers, and then on premise, all our restaurants, bars, th these are where people come together uh, to enjoy our products. Yeah, you know, and that's really the role of our category is to create a future with more cheers and to, to dream big to do that. So so this is where people are coming together every day to enjoy each other's company, to enjoy our products. So so it's a critical. Uh, uh, channel for us to be able to to deliver against our role in the category. Absolutely. I'm sure you, I mean, like so many businesses, you had this kind of um, slingshot effect where you're focused on your business and then, oh no, there's no more on-premise because all the premises are closed. So we need to focus on direct-to-consumer and the liquor stores. And now all of a sudden people are coming back in and you have to focus on that side. And it's not easy to be a marketer trying to move this quickly when you have such a large organization. Yeah. Well, we learned we learned a lot in the pandemic, to be honest, because the the existing plans, as you said, got thrown out the window, and yeah, it, it, it realized you know, the power that we could do when we come together as a team, um, and really focus on solving consumer problems, uh, and then being able as a global company to to test and learn solutions in one market that works, and then we're able to scale that globally around the world through the sharing of our best practices. So. Uh, again, we're, 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 we're honored for the recognitions that we've received, but we remain humble as we're learning every day on how we can improve. Absolutely. Uh, so you've mentioned a lot of times the World Cup, and obviously this World Cup is unique for many reasons. One, it's in November. Normally happens over the summer. We are in a time of great global turmoil um, and you know, socioeconomic issues impacting different markets at different scales across the world. So obviously uh, an event like the World Cup, like the, Olymp like the Olympics is a great unifier. It brings people together. It also exposes some of the issues that we have, um, but there's no, there's no debating that there's gonna be eyeballs around this, billions of eyeballs around the world. What goes into a decision to have AB uh, and, and, and Budweiser participate at such a large level as part of the World Cup? Like, what are some of the discussions that you have to pull the trigger on, on such a large investment? Yeah, I think, well, the first thing, you know, uh, we've been a, a global partner of the FIFA World Cup for over 30 years on Budweiser. So, uh, you know, we've, we've proven uh, that this partnership, uh, as you said, is a, can be a huge unifying moment for the world. Yeah. Like, it's the biggest sporting event in the world. And when we talk about building a community and being relevant to our audience, you want to be relevant in their passion points. And, and international football uh, and the World Cup is, is one of the biggest passion points uh, for, for a global brand to, to be able to activate. So, um, you know, that's that's one, one big reason. And, and to be honest, we're super excited this year because now it's going to be our biggest ever global campaign uh, that we've ever launched on Budweiser with the FIFA World Cup. The world's yours to take. I know we'll get into it some more. Yeah, we're gonna we'll do it right now. Over, over 70 countries, you know, over 1.2 million pox around the world. Um, and, you know, we've got a, a fully integrated, as we've talked about, 
full funnel, omni-channel approach uh, on how we're bringing the campaign to life. And when you activate in 70 markets, obviously you need a through line, which is essentially the brand equity pillars and some of the things that you talked about in terms of the heritage of brand. But then you have to translate it on a local level. You know, talk about that process because I... I can't imagine the complexities involved in that where you don't want to have the wrong message in the wrong market <laughs> to alienate a, a huge market of consumers. You know, I'm, I imagine you trust your agency partners, but is there sort of a process you have in, in these global executions? Sure, yeah. Well, you know, this year's campaign uh, is The World is Yours to Take, and it features some of the top footballers in the world. We've got Lionel Messi, we've got Neymar Jr., we've got Raheem Sterling. Uh, we've got the cross-section to music. We've got Little Baby, who's remixed the iconic Tears for Fears. Everybody Wants to Rule the World track. Very cool. Um, as, a, as the official soundtrack for the FIFA World Cup. Um, so, you know, we, we, and the, the whole idea behind the campaign is, you know, over the last two years, a lot of people's ambitions, dreams have kind of been put on hold. And we're using, you know, our players, uh, you know, in the metaphor of the players tunnel, you'll see in the main film, they're, they're on, in, in the players tunnel about to step out onto greatness. And by telling their story of how they've overcome obstacles and defied the naysayers, we want to inspire everybody this FIFA World Cup to really step up and go for it. Reach for whatever your greatness is in life to go for it. So, so that's a universal message we feel that can really land globally uh, during this FIFA World Cup. Sure. And then we're also partnering with a lot of our local uh, markets. We're actually bringing uh, over 100 creators and influencers from around the world to Doha to participate in an amazing, um, you know, BudX Doha experience uh over the the tournament and, and they're going to tell their side tunnel you know what's what's been their their story of how they've they've overcome obstacles to to really you know go forward and, and believe in themselves uh, to achieve great things in life so and that's where the local flavor can come in on on the local right. creators and influencers telling telling the world kind of their side tunnel to, to really inspire people to go for it. Yeah, and I mean, that's amazing. And I think that's really emblematic of how a lot of brands are shifting from a linear broadcast model, although I know that you still get a lot of ROI from large scale national TV spots, but you know, being able to localize and create content from these creators, I would imagine is something that allows you to go across the funnel um, and also really talk to those audiences in a unique way are you, how are you looking at the creator economy more broadly in terms of your forward-looking strategy? I think it's a great point. I think, you know, you think about one of the things that has accelerated over the last couple of years is the development of this creator economy where, yep. you know, influencers, creators have created their audience at a one-to-one -one level and now they're monetizing it through launching their own products. You know, you look at the success of a Mr. Beast. Crazy. Um, it's unbelievable what he did. 100,000 people he showing up to buy his burgers. I know, it's, it's, it's unreal. So there's a lot that we need to learn from that as big brands. Like if we're not, as I, back to my point, if we're not building our, our community, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna get there, they're gonna go elsewhere. They're, you know, we need to provide utility and value through content, through offers, whatever it may be to, to really keep that community engaged. But we also, you know, beyond the big sponsorships like the Messi's and Neymar's and the creators that we have, what we need to find, what are those next generation of creators and influencers in, in this creator economy that we as a brand can help them? How do we help remove barriers to them? Yep. Whether it be, um, you know, visibility. We have huge reach as a brand. You know, we have huge access to, to talent from a mentorship perspective. Um, how do we as a brand, you know, then find that, that next generation and work with them as well as the same level that we're doing with the big tier tier one celebrities and athletes as well. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. A friend of mine is starting a snacks business, a startup, and she said, if I were to bring on a partner, you know, because she's super into the marketing side of things, who should I bring on to give equity to? And I said, it should be a celebrity or an influencer because they have to build an audience and distribution. And over time, if you have to pay for that distribution, it's going to cut into, you know, your cost of goods sold. It's going to cut into your margins, where if you have somebody, like you talk about a Mr. Beast, she won't be able to get somebody that big. But anybody that has a built-in audience, I mean, that is, a, in a lot of ways, the future of how the new brands are being built. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, and in that regard, so Little Baby isn't exactly, you know, he's a creator in, you know, the more um, mainstream sense. And, you know, I, I found it really interesting 
that you're partnering with them to basically create, as you guys put it, the official anthem of the World Cup. So are you kind of, you're co-releasing a song with him? How does that work? Because that's a new model in the music industry that wasn't yeah. around five to ten years ago. Yeah, no, definitely. We uh, we released the, the song together with uh, Little Baby uh, as a remix of the Tears for Fears, uh, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Yeah. Uh, it's available on all his DSP platforms from Spotify to Apple Playlist, um, all, all the major players. And uh, we partnered with FIFA to make it an official soundtrack uh, for the FIFA World Cup as well. Uh, and then back to the comment of bringing 100 creators uh, together in, in Qatar for a big Budex um, influencer weekend. Little Baby will be performing uh, on uh, his birthday in Doha with wow. the creators. And we're going to actually recreate uh, the original Tears for Fears music video in Doha at the World Cup with the 100 creators. Uh, and ironically enough, if you if you Google the original um, original video, they were actually driving dune buggies in the desert. There was a guy drinking a Budweiser. So there's a lot of irony uh, coming to play and we're excited to partner with him, with FIFA, with all the creators. To The song's already been released, but now we're gonna launch the official music video in, in Doha together during the World Cup. It's amazing. It's not lost on me to my comment earlier where that kind of tension between the history and nostalgia of the brand with sort of forward looking that you're tapping into Tears for Fears, tapping into nostalgia, and nostalgia's huge. Britney Spears just came out with, you know, a remix of Elton John songs. We're seeing it all the time in music because that is unifying as well because you're bringing people who remember that song from the old days like me um, and then the new generation that likes the artist and they're like, oh, I love this song. Many of them don't even know it was, it was it's a remix. Uh, the younger consumers, but that's totally cool. There's that, two huge trends in music. You just mentioned it. The the nostalgia is one. Mm -hmm. and actually, artists co covering old tracks from from back in the day that new audience hasn't hasn't heard right. before. So it's uh, you see it all the time happening. Yeah, Diddy was actually the the person that I think first came to the market with that um, in the '90s, and now obviously it's become way more mainstream. But um, we're gonna shift gears. Listening. Sorry. Go on, please. No, I was just I was just listening to a Jack Harlow uh, podcast and. He talked about, you know, he, he sampled, you know, Fergie's uh, song uh, that, that just went crazy. And yeah. hearing him talk about how he went through the creative process to sample that and it became, you know, what it is today with the, with his career. So, so absolutely another example. Spot on. So we're going to shift gears a little bit to the, the category you're in in general um, and some of the big trends that you're seeing, uh, one of which is non-alcoholic beverages. Uh, that's obviously had a big rise. Part of which I believe is is part and parcel with the rise of cannabis use and cannabis legalization, at least in the U.S. But I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts in terms of the non-alcoholic beer market, the growth there, and some maybe that and some other emerging categories you're looking to play in as an extension of the Budweiser brand. Well, you said it. Health, health and wellness is an unstoppable trend. Um, it's growing everywhere around the world. Um, and so we're always looking as AB and Bev to innovate uh, and mm -hmm. deliver solutions for for consumers needs as they evolve um, specific to Budweiser you know part of health and wellness is moderation people yep. are looking for the same great taste as the Budweiser but without the alcohol um, so we're we've been you know proud to launch Budweiser zero uh, in a number of markets around the world uh, it's in the US it's in Canada India Europe um, you know, expanded. We just launched into Brazil. Uh, it's doing very well. It's uh, especially with a, a younger, at the legal drinking age audience um, who want this. You know, the the same social uh, benefit from gathering with your friends at different occasions, but they don't want uh, the alcohol. So right. uh, we're offering we're offering Budweiser Zero. Uh, and to be honest, the FIFA World Cup is a great opportunity for us that we're going to be expanding our presence. Um, not only uh, physically on the ground in, in Doha, where Budweiser Zero will be made available, um, but also expanding it uh, into other countries using the FIFA World Cup because there's occasions based off time zones where you're not going to be able to, to drink a, a, a regular Budweiser, but you can still have the great benefit of the occasion and the great sure. taste of Budweiser without the alcohol. <clears throat> How about some of the macroeconomic conditions? You know, obviously we're seeing rising costs of commodities, you know, the consumers facing pressure. How do the macro conditions in a local market impact your strategy and, and how you step on the gas, either through your retail channels or through your spend? 
Yeah, well, we have uh, obviously everyone's facing uh, crazy macroeconomic inflation across the board. So yep. you know, we work very closely uh, with with all of our local markets to make sure that you know we're um, you know delivering solutions a- a- against that. So. Uh, I think the first and foremost thing is you just need to continue to be relevant to the consumer and, you know, offer them the right product at the right time in the right format, um, you know, and, and ensure that you're doing that in, you know, um, the most effective way possible. And that's why we pride ourselves so much on creative effectiveness, uh, because in challenging economic times, you know, you can prove the, the return on investment on what you're doing is working. Uh, you can scale that to other countries, to other zones, um, uh, and ultimately uh, ensure you're delivering the right the right product at the right time. To absolutely, the that's what it's about. So, and, and to wrap things up, I mean, heading past past the World Cup, although I'm sure you're not looking past it right now, it's probably glaring you right in the face given it's next month. But as we head into 2023, um, any other big innovations or, or initiatives on the horizon for Budweiser that that we should know about, or just things that that you're really looking keenly at? I think we're obviously, you know, football is a huge passion point for the brand. So post World Cup, uh, we're going to continue to to activate, you know, the, the our football community. Yeah. Um, you know, we have a great partnership with the English Premier League globally. So we're going to continue to really focus uh, on that conversion side of things around the football occasion. Um, post World Cup with with our Premier League partnership. Um, you know, we talked a lot about inspiring, you know, that next generation of creators to really step up and go for it. So we want to continue, you know, with uh, landing that, 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 that creative idea uh, for Budweiser globally around the world. Like our new global campaign is yours to take. Um, you know, we launched the first equity campaign with, with tomorrow's yours to take in, in Q1 of this year with great partnership with Anderson Pack and seven other creators from around the world. We're carrying that through with the World Cup, with the world that is yours to take. Uh, and we're just going to continue really to both not only inspire, but also enable. How do we do, how do we walk the talk and actually help remove barriers uh, for our audience to ultimately step up and, and go for it and chase their passions in life? Because that's what Budweiser is about. It's about ambition. It's about optimism. And and, and really inspiring people to, to, to go forward in life, no matter what are the obstacles that you're facing. Yep, and from your, where, where you sit, it's really your job to kind of lead that charge for the brand, be a steward of the brand, make sure you're protecting it, and, you know, amidst all of these tactics and sort of global deployment. And that's sort of, um, I think it's it's no easy feat. So I admire you for doing it and congrats on your success, um, especially with the effectiveness awards, which I think are, you know, are really important for marketers. And that, what many marketers lose sight of is in this day and age, but now there's tremendous cost pressures to make sure that, as you put it earlier, there's business results to spend. So to wrap things up here, uh, you know, we covered a lot of ground. Obviously, you're juggling a lot of things. What are some of the things that slow down Todd Allen personally? allow you to take a step away from the world of beer and Budweiser uh, to kind of um, get a little bit of a refreshment in a, in a mental state for you? Uh, well, first of all, I have two young children. I have a four-year-old daughter, Charlotte, and a two-year-old boy, Jack. Oh, I have a daughter, Charlotte, too. So we're, oh, there nice. you go. Simpatico. Uh, <laughs> but trying to spend as much time with them recharges my, my batteries uh, the most. And then we love to, to ski in the winter as a family. Charlotte's started at two, and I got Jack up for the first time last winter. So excited to, to get out on the hills with them this winter and uh, you know, just enjoy each other's company and yeah. my beautiful wife as well. Well, that's amazing. Well, I want to thank you for joining, uh, Todd. It's not every day I get to talk to uh, the head of such an iconic global brand, and uh, it's been a joy for me, and I know it's going to be a joy for our audience. So uh, on behalf of Susie and Adwee team, thanks again for Todd for joining us. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care.